This week, we welcome back Gabe Gums, the Chief Innovation Officer at Spirion, to discuss how hackers may change their strategy to target those working from home and what we can do about it and what the potential exposures are. In our second segment, we welcome Bianca Lewis, founder and CEO of Girls Who Hack, to discuss, well, Girls Who Hack, uh, teaching classes to middle school girls on hacking, and Secure Open Vote, the open source election system that is in the design stages. In the final segment, we air our pre-recorded interview with Dora Naparstek, the director of R&D at NanoLock Security, to discuss IoT security and some innovative strategies on how to prevent such things. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. NetSparker, the developers of a comprehensive automated web security platform that includes web vulnerability scanning, assessment, and management. NetSparker's desktop and cloud-based security solutions employ a unique and dead accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities and provides a proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at securityweekly.com forward slash NetSparker. The biggest problem in security that remains unsolved is flat networks inside the cloud and data center that allow threats to move laterally and compromise vulnerable targets. But micro-segmentation using traditional firewalls is too complex and time-consuming. There's a better approach. Edgewise Zero Trust Auto Segmentation. Edgewise is impossibly simple micro-segmentation. Using the identity of machines and software that are communicating, Edgewise offers the strongest protection that adapts automatically to changes. Protect any application in any cloud without any changes to your network by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash edgewise. Welcome to the show. But first, let me introduce you to a man who, under great restraint, has managed to not lick anyone's eyeballs this evening. Mr. Paul Sidorian. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to Paul Security Weekly. It's episode 643, recorded on March 12, 2020, at G-Unit Studios right here in Rhode Island. Uh, to my left is the illustrious Mr. Larry Pesci. Coming off a, a keynote, a virtual keynote yeah. at Wild West Hagen Fest. Yeah, with Mr. Uh, Mr. Mike Poor. Apparently it... Uh, was quite fun. Yes, good. it's good. good. I think we could see a lot of virtual things happening <laughs> in the next several weeks. I would imagine months. Yeah. You think? Yeah, could, could be. Yeah, could be. Maybe. maybe. Mr. Jeff Mann is here in studio. I am. Could be the last time I'm in studio for a while. You never know. You never know. The most exciting ever. part is there's no lag. <laughs> there is there is no lag when you're here in studio. That is true. Uh, towards the end, there might be a little bit of lag. There might of, be. Uh, you know, that's a different kind of Consuming adult lag. beverages. Yep. Tyler Robinson's here with us from some unnamed retail store, apparently, in Idaho. <laughs> it's it's Got to break, break into some places someday. It's the, it's the local FedEx office. That's all it is. <laughs> that's what it, yes. Could be. Could be. Welcome, Tyler. Mr. Lee Neely is here with us. Welcome, Lee. Ah, good evening. We're... Uh, here in Idaho, enjoying enjoying a beautiful day, and wearing a very interesting shirt. On the now, wait. If you guys are in Idaho, why don't why don't you do it from the same? Oh, it's not like Rhode Island, where like, you <laughs> get. <laughs> no, Idaho's a little broader. We're about what three hundred miles apart. Yeah, about four hours. Oh, I see. Yeah. So no, it is three hundred miles, and Idaho is four hours, right? Well, yeah, about three and a half hours. Really. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So it's just lack yeah. of commitment, basically, is what you're saying. <laughs> uh, pretty much. Pretty much. Oh, yes, oh boy. Uh, Register for our... Black Spire Output shirt. Yeah, what is that shirt, Lee? Black Spire Output from Disneyland. We were just there last weekend. And, uh, you know, I was wanted something a little warmer to wear, so I, what the heck. And I was riding the new uh, Rise of the Resistance ride. We rode a couple of times. Really awesome ride. That's awesome. awesome. But did you That's get awesome. Mickey Mouse ears? I didn't. Oh, no, he got the cool shirt. You got the shirt. Cool. I've got mouse ears already. That's right. It's awesome. awesome. Uh, register for our upcoming webcast and virtual trainings by visiting securityweekly.com. Select the webcast training drop down menu from the top bar. Our first virtual online training with online business systems 
will learn you will learn how to generate complex sha 256 hashed passwords wow if i can get that out then use password cracking tools to break it in our next uh webcast is with Gravwell. we'll cut through the marketing buzzwords and teach you about collecting and analyzing logs in hybrid cloud environments all righty no stranger to the show Gabe Gums is here with us. He is a 19-year tenure in cybersecurity, and uh, many may not know was uh, hacking in hacking in the 90s in New York City. We were having that discussion uh, earlier because I said I was watching hackers with uh, Wait a my younger kids, and like, and when Gabe came on to uh, talking to him today, I'm like, dude, you were like there, like in rollerblades, like in the whole the whole scene, right, wow. Gabe? Everything except the rollerblades, but um, those those that are familiar with me now and and are are used to seeing me in this giddy up would be surprised to see me in my old school punk giddy up. It doesn't. It did doesn't, you? It, but did you have? Did you have an afro though? You know, I did. I don't know if you were guessing that, but I'm not kidding. I, oh, I know because like uh, Kevin finished there. I guess that the fro going sometimes. I'm like, dude, you should leave. That. Like, I, that's awesome. <laughs> so <laughs> random random question, Gabe. Did you ever? visit i'll use the word visit fordham university in the so, 90s uh, so i actually i attended fordham prep which is on the campus of fordham university okay uh, yeah, the law school is in manhattan but the other one is down in the bronx mm -hmm. so the answer is yes i have interesting i was i was one of my first commercial customers oh was fordham university we we oh, ended up uh, having a uh I was chairing, I was a facilitator for a group encounter session of uh, professors and administrators that were freaking out that the university wanted to put a firewall up uh, yep. between the university and their internet connection. I had those very same discussions at a different university. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, the topic for today is uh, obviously with uh, the COVID-19, uh, people are trying to stay home. Uh, to prevent the spread of the virus, which I, I think largely we agree is a smart thing to do right now, mm -hmm. uh, especially for those that can work from home uh, and do their jobs from home. It has no impact, right? Other than, hey, you're just working in your pajamas rather than coming into the office. Um, maybe you're in pajamas. <laughs> maybe you're in pajamas. Maybe you're not. Maybe Conference you, call naked. Maybe you get dressed. That could be our, a new slogan for us. Um, but, you know, Gabe brought up a good point. He's like, well, hold on. What about security? Uh, specifically data security, but other security, uh, missing security measures could lead to a compromise of data security. Uh, what do we do about it? I guess first start with like when people start working from home more and more uh, on a more grand scale, um, what are the what are the security concerns? What what's missing at home that attackers could prey on? Lots oh, of things. Lots I of think. things. Right? Or, or it's not necessarily what's missing; it's also what's present. Yes, and it is secured improperly or poorly, or not secured at all. Yeah. Where do I mean, you start? <laughs> yeah. Right. Jeez. I mean, there's a couple of things that jump out for me. If you go back to when uh, Mayor took over at Yahoo, like if you recall, she kind of rescinded the work from home policy for a number of employees. And it started a trend in, in a lot of companies also doing similar things. And so folks working back in offices again. And I have no less than half a dozen friends whose organizations uh, don't have kind of remote policies, right? So they have a lot of they have a lot of machines and hardware and whatnot that's all in the office. And you know some small percentage of them are remote in, in terms of they have laptops. But even those that have laptops, right, um, that, that's a different concern. But let's start with the first one. So now uh, these companies have told the employees to stay home, stay home, and they're working from personal equipment. And I'm like, my head's just going, so you're going to let them, like, work on all of your sensitive information from their home machines? But, but let's say it's not their home machines. Let, let's say it is the work machines. There's still so many other problems that, that are present. I mean, the least of which is attackers are very good at exploiting chaos chaos breeds opportunity and you're, you're going to see an uptick in phishing emails and, and every other campaign that they can do to get their hands on your sensitive data and you know i i know everyone these days they've got iot devices on their 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 systems and lord knows someone else can like you know that router password is password right you know they haven't read it. It's, and we can we can piece this apart six weeks on sunday but ultimately what you're going to see is you're going to see a lot of people working on a lot of information, 
um, whether they're connecting through VPNs or using cloud services, and all of that is just going to be for the taken for these attackers. And so, you know, we, we do need to start having this conversation about what are, what are our disaster recovery plans for those working from home, and, and how do we make that a data centric one as well? Not just they make sure that you know they've got AV on their machine. That's that's awesome, but you know, AV is not going to do a lot when I'm hooking your browser and stealing other things as well, too. So. So I have a question for all of us, because um, I hung up my pen testing hat many years ago. I'm curious as to how one would approach finding all these remote employees uh, that are out there for any given company. How w what, what are the steps that you would go through, which you know hopefully then gets us into a discussion of how do you protect that. But you know, it, put your bad guy hat on how do you find all these people in the first place that are employees of particular companies? Oh, I, I I'm going to take, I'm going to take that one Please. first oh. and then I'll, I'll pass it to the group. It's uh, a, it's a little bit of a softball. It is. Cause I mean, you got to do reconnaissance, right? Whether it's on the company website or social media. And if you're targeting a company, look for people that are posting, Hey, working from home, right? Cause people love to share what they're doing mm -hmm. on social right. media. Yeah. Right. Then you find their email addresses, which there's a number of different ways uh, to do that, I mean, it could be it could be super easy mm -hmm. to find out who, where their email addresses are. Now, knowing that they might open those emails at home, uh, some simple scripts or or droppers that uh, report back their IP address. Now you know that's coming from a cable modem, mm -hmm. um, and that they are in fact working from home. Home networks today are largely. We were talking earlier, Jeff, right? Mm -hmm. They, I think, home networks go back to that uh, kind of crunchy outside and really soft interior. Sure. Yep. Now I've got a lot more juicy targets on the inside that I can attack and persist on because I think the thing that's very scary for me about this situation is that um, the, they're not going to have network separation at home. When you're right. at home, there's no like other thing that you're connected to when you're doing work. And then if there is, when you're not doing that, you're going to connect back to your own network if there even is some level of I'm, separation I'm, between I, the two. Again, for most people now that are moving to go to work from home, that is absolutely the case. But I can think of at least one or more people on this podcast that do have one of those type of networks. And or sure. I can think of more than a dozen people that we have worked with or do work with that have those types of networks right mm -hmm. but those people are outside of the norm well uh, right. those people are mostly largely security professionals <laughs> right or people yes. that have but you're, have but you're to saying take. security professionals are better at this right that <laughs> but, no, 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 no. i'm not saying i'm not saying we're better at this i'm saying we're more likely to have separate networks at home and have our work computer on one network and the wi-fi disabled so that it does not connect to our our home network as a very very small percentage of those of us that work from home. Would you but agree I, or, or disagree, Tyler? I want you to weigh in. No, no, well. I, I definitely, definitely agree. There's that one percent of us paranoid people, but I don't even think that's the general security population. Uh, you look at yeah. people that sit on the defensive side, and the percentage of them that have segregated networks or have laptops that they have to work from home. I will say a ma good majority of the people I know and have personally seen. Uh, I realize that they don't segregate their networks because it's hard at home, right? You got stuff you got to do. So you end up with two problems, right? You have one, you have all these people working from home that aren't used to working from home that yep. may or may not be security people that have a very uh, high likelihood of getting infected from something on their local network, which has probably already happened. But now you have an entire workforce outside of even security or IT people that now have a higher risk, have a place, maybe they have to leave their house because they have kids at home, so they're going to the local coffee shop. So you have this high uh, probability of really, really open networks and corporate data being leaked from there. But on the flip side of that, you have all these corporations that are now having to open things or provide uh, different ways into the network externally and then potentially internally in order to do their job and their function. Like some of these apps may have been segregated between networks, but now you have a VPN coming in uh, that might have been stood up in a hurry that is less than secure, doesn't have mm. two-factor. And hey, we had to take down that segment or that VLAN so that these all these users coming in externally can get to their application to do their job. So you've got multiple areas in which, as an attacker right now, I would be operating at like 24/7 just to to kind of hammer away at these. You know, both physically, virtually, figuring out layer two or layer three, 
traffic and where all these IPs are coming in, converging on the IP space of, of different organizations and targeting those. Like, there's a ton of really bad things that can happen right now. Mm. Well, uh, but, uh, go ahead, Lee. Sorry. Well, the other thing I was thinking about is we used to really worry about with VPN people doing split tunnel because that really <laughs> provided a nice path around. Is that still, are people still split tunneling or are we yes. gotten past that? 100%. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I think that's some of the insecure configurations Tyler was alluding to. But I, Well, I can give you a, I, I mean, I've been working from home for over 20 years and, and the most practical application or abuse, if you want to call it, for split tunneling is you're, you're doing work you know, on a work laptop, you're VPN'd in, and you want to print something. And you've got the local <laughs> printer. That, I mean, right. that, yes. that's where right. I want split right. tunneling because, damn it, i got to print something. Right. But e even if you do keep that level of separation, let's say you are done working for the day, and now you take your laptop, and then you go connect to your local network when you're off the VPN. Right. My malware is still going to phone home. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's, well, it I, may uh, phone uh, home with a, a different... A different local IP address that tells me, hey, you're not on the corporate. Now you're on this other juicy And I've know, worked target. for several companies over the years, and there have been companies where when I was vpn there was no split tunneling. I right. couldn't do anything else. And and there's others where it's a little bit more relaxed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as a general rule, if I wanted to print something when it was locked down, I had to drop the VPN. Right. And then I'm re-engaging with my local area With your network local network where I'm compromising you putting malware and then you're going back and connecting to your <laughs> <Yeah>. corporate network. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, wanted, I wanted to push back on uh, at least a little bit on your, your initial premise uh, in responding to my initial question. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's just, uh, again, it's a curiosity. And maybe it, it falls under the category of risk assessment. But... Uh, in a commercial context, not necessarily national security and defense department and all that, but in the commercial world, a lot of the breaches that are reported, the companies weren't t necessarily targeted. They just sure. happened to be vulnerable to something, you know, in, in, you know, the recon or OSINT that, you know, the bad guys were doing, looking for targets of opportunity, not to use, mm -hmm. I, I hate using that term. That's how they found target, right? They they weren't going after Target. They just happened to find a way mm -hmm. to exploit Target. And I'm wondering how that plays into the the risk assessment for companies that are now trying to figure out what to do with all their remote employees. I, it's a, my pure sense DOD mindset is it doesn't matter, but from a practical uh, aspect, you know, companies have to deal with this question. What's the likelihood that bad guys are now going to go after us because now we have that many more remote employees out there doing perhaps more things? I mean, I agree with what Tyler's saying. It's the whole notion that there's more things now becoming remotely available that beyond what the norm was. I mean, most people get their email or I, in my experience, it seems like most people these days get work email, at least on their phones, if not having ability to log in from a home computer, if they don't already work from home, to get their email at the very least. So there's some sort of connectivity to the mothership at some level. Um, I, I'm just curious as to how do, you, how do you begin to evaluate this as a company from a risk assessment perspective as you're trying to develop the strategy for what do you do with your, your newly... Uh, remote workforce. Gabe, uh, uh, Gabe I, I want to turn it over to you in, in terms of, you know, protecting the data, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we talk about all these different ways in and out, but ultimately it comes down to how do you protect the data, right? Uh, so, the, number one, you're, I, I, I have no problems with your term. I like it because attackers are opportunistic. They are, unless they are specifically targeting an organization, you, the first answer to your question is, you know, what do you do strategically is you admit that they are opportunistic and it's not are they targeting me it's are they targeting people connected to the internet and the answer is yes right yes. like the answer is <laughs> undoubtedly they absolutely are you do bring up another really good point though it's like they're they're already connected to emails etc um you know they're going to say 0365 the, the bad guy attacking that as a vector uh, it's, it's fairly low but what are you doing when you connect to that because you're working from home now so right to the data so now i'm working on files that I would have worked on in the office. But now instead of working on those on a more secure network, they're they're on my laptop. Maybe it's my same work laptop, which might be great, which hopefully is is good and all those things are locked down. Um, but that's that's the target ultimately. I, I still want to get access to to those files and that data. That's that's what I'm after. Um, 
if I get access to your credentials to get into your your Outlook or anything else, I'm still I'm still coming after the data. So, Paul, to answer your question directly, this does come down to to one of the fundamental tenets of you know what data is there. So, if you were to ask the question of your organization now, okay, what percentage of my workforce is going to be accessing sensitive information? from their home machines? Is it 100%? Should 100% have access to that? Like, I, I'm assuming the answer to that question is no. I, I can look around my organization and tell you the answer is definitely no. And that's that's one of the areas where we certainly should look. But a lot of folks are going to default to the tried and true and the basics, which 100% they should. Are those machines patched? Good. Check. Those machines have AV? Absolutely. Good. Check. But a lot of them are going to neglect what data are my employees using that they have access to? Are they going to leave behind in these machines now? And they're going to log into their 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 OA account in 65 from their personal machines at home also. They're very comfortable in their personal machines. That's that's going to happen. It's not an if. Even for those that have work issued laptops, they're definitely going to access email over the course of weeks and month and a month or months. They're not all going to access this data from their corporate machines that data is going to end up everywhere mm. yeah i think I wonder... one thing to to keep in mind too as you're as you're thinking about data and and the workforce is there there's two pieces to that right you have the kind of core business functionality data what data is important to the business what data brings us revenue what data are we trying to secure uh, as our main purpose but then you have to realize again going back to the attacker mindset the attackers are opportunistic uh, there's going to be two things they do. One is either they end up getting access to other data, say your data is not you know, your HR data. You still have HR data. You still have people. You still have PII. That's a reputa reputational and you know, from a hacker standpoint, like they're making you look bad and it's getting them bona fides. Uh, that's a reputational damage piece. It may not be your main data point, uh, but that's still data with inside your network. So you still have to treat all data with inside your network as – uh, important, maybe not as important, but you still have to evaluate it as risk. And then the second is really looking at, from an attacker standpoint, uh, I would be infiltrating, implanting, and then laying my persistence down and making it very, very long term. Uh, I may not have another opportunity or it may be much more difficult to get inside of a network later uh, if I don't do this now. So if I implant and I lay low, and then when everybody returns from the workforce back into the corporate network, I'm, I've got a bunch of ingress points, a bunch of initial access points that I can then laterally move from uh, and begin doing a full-scale operation. So well, Tyler, multiple to your, risk to your vectors point, you look at. If I ramp up my phishing attacks now and I compromise these computers, whether they're home or, or work or whatever, right, and let's just say they're home, the network protections that exist in the corporate home base don't necessarily, in very few cases, exist mm -hmm. at your home. Right. This means you're yeah, threat the hunting. Next gen layer seven is not there, right? Right. This means you're threat hunting, your net Drink. flow analysis, all that stuff oh. that's looking for the persistence that putting a laptop isn't there. So, you know, now in a few weeks or a month or maybe two months, when everyone starts to hopefully return to normal in that time frame, mm -hmm. um, we then have these callbacks that are still at someone's home computer that still have that data on them, right? Maybe they transfer into the ones that go in the corporate network, but you're going to have a great time, especially in the next few weeks or months, exfiltrating that data without anyone looking at all the net flow going, mm -hmm. why is this you know, one packet going to this one host on the internet every 24 hours, right? That's gone. Right. That's missing from your, your defenses. So now what do you do? You know, so, something that Tyler said was interesting because, you know, he talked about how you got to consider all the data and, and consider the risk. You know, we were talking earlier today on a future segment that will be yeah. aired about, you know, it's all about the information. One of the lessons that I learned from the DOD days was not only the classification level of, of data, you know, uh, not that it's just classified or company confidential to put it in a commercial context, but you know, there's a difference between confidential information and secret and top secret and top secret compartmented. One of those differences is sort of the life expectancy or the usefulness of the, of, of the mm -hmm. data. Um, uh, there's, diff there's a lot of different things that go into what makes a different class a data classification level. Far and away at the companies that I've been to over the years, Data classification is is either 
it's unclassified, public, we don't care about it, or it's company confidential. And they just kind of lump everything into one bucket. And I think that's one of the, the lessons that hasn't carried forward mm. from the DOD to the private sector is the idea that not only do you need to look at your data and figure out what it is and what's sensitive, but you've got to look at other aspects of it to try to make determinations of, it, do we need to protect this data for an hour or do we need to protect it for a year? Or do we need to protect it forever? Mm -hmm. uh, and and what that looks like in a commercial context, I think, would vary from business to business. But that would factor into a risk assessment where you're trying to figure out, you know, like in, in talking about, you know, all these people are now going to be accessing sensitive data that they didn't ordinarily do because their day job was on site. I'm wondering... Uh, and I don't know the answer. I'm just wondering, you know, how many people that have that regular access to the most com sensitive company data, you know, merger and acquisition data, the financial data, uh, you know, s you know, prices. You know, if you're a if you're a, a manufacturer, the prices that you charge one customer versus another. Uh, you know, whatever it is, research data. You know, how many of the people that have access to that already already had laptops and are already doing some work at home versus the s the population of the employees that always do it from the office? I, I'm curious. Uh, I, I think that's I, a great point. I suspect that's, that that's a risk. Right? Yeah, but I think a lot of the people that have access to the most sensitive data, right or wrong, probably already take it home with them. You know, all the executives, all the. <laughs> all the financial people, the lawyers, all the you know, the researchers, they're probably the ones that more likely are s allowed to work remotely anyway. The, the higher level, the more critical the functions, they tend to be the ones that get the liberties, like working from home, mm -hmm. versus the people that have to come on site. Maybe they don't have the regular access to the, m the most sensitive data. Hypothesis. I don't know if that's uh, right or well, wrong. Well, I, I think, no, Gabe, I mean, just to kind of set the stage for you is uh, when I've worked with pharmaceutical companies, a lot of times it's, it's just the opposite. That most mm -hmm. sensitive data is very tightly well, protected. Well, I think it's going to vary from industry or right. from company to company. But in, in that, to your point, Jeff, right, in that situation, they recognize how sensitive it is. Right. There's very strict rules. You, e Even if you're the owner of the company, you can't take that data home. Right. right. And there's right. protections to make sure you don't accidentally do that. Right. Right. But you're right. When you get into corporate America, sometimes uh, in most organizations, there's no separation between public and classified or sensitive. Right. And look at look at legal or look at financial. Like right. this is one of the things that we've been harping on for for many years. In fact, it's an entire service line I've been trying to push you know out into the industry is executive level targeting. Right. The notion that, you know, this is new. This is not new. Like executives are people that don't want to be impeded to do their job they typically are ones that have to sign off on any kind of big transaction or any big decision they have access to most of the data in most of the industries and they're the ones that travel that want the laptop easy to access they're the ones on planes going to public you know coffee shops that take their laptop home so this executive level targeting is nothing new uh, you know they're the ones that have all the IOT devices that do all the amazing things at these big elaborate houses right and probably have no technical experience so executives have always been a target and this is yeah. something that many corporations haven't thought about like wh how do we protect our executives how do we help them at their home office how do we help them uh, ensure that whatever data they have on their laptop is being secured because I, they don't know, know any better but they want to access you know, well, hold, hold on you know Tyler that's a great those are great questions for Gabe <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let me set up one, one more fast. Let me rephrase my question. In all of our experience where, we, where we're working with companies, how many uh, you know, employees of the, of the company these days have a desktop versus a laptop? And let's just start with whether, or, whether they're allowed to take it home with them or not. How many people actually have a desktop versus right. a laptop? So, Gabe, days? desktop versus yeah. laptop, and how do we control that most sensitive data, especially from executives? So I, I really only have anecdotal advice on or information on the desktop versus laptop, which is, uh, again, in this last week, I, I can tell you about half a dozen organizations that um, were predominantly desktops. And I was I was particularly shocked myself. I'm like, really, that's still that much of a thing. But I'm sure if I did some just market research and how many desktops have sold it in, into the enterprise, which right. I'm not a to find right now, which is a little Googling, I'm willing to bet it's a, it's a healthy number. The executive thing is it's totally spot on right um 
there's there's no two ways about it but you have a different challenge there in so much that i at least know that my executives probably have sensitive data in fact they have sensitive data so what mm -hmm. you have there that you point out is you have any you have a friction problem which is one that still requires a lot of solving those executives do want to be able to quickly do things etc so that you've got more of a fr friction problem there but they're a smaller pool with a larger problem you've got a larger pool also with a smaller problem of so which one of all of the other employees do have access to sensitive data what where, where is that data that they have so it definitely two very real problems just kind of different different attack vectors and different ends of the spectrum um right. i would i would argue that it might be easier to solve one of those than the other but it requires a different approach i might be a little bit biased in that argument though if only because you know as an executive myself i happen to be a security professional so i'm like of course i know how to do those things or at least more importantly i take those things into consideration and i make sure i socialize those things you know amongst my peers and you know, we also have a CISO here as well too who does those things you know for us um but we're also not a a, a ridiculously large organization where we're relatively small con you know in comparison but uh but where's that so how data? are you solving that say that again so how, how are you kind of going about solving that? I'm, I'm just curious. I'm, I'm looking for to you to kind of outline, like, what, what are you doing around those particular? Um... On the executive side for us, it's just a whole lot of education, education, education. Um, but again, being a security company, we are an outlier in this, right? We we have people who think about this every single day. So we're, we're quite a bit of an outlier in that perspective. So I don't know if I can offer you great advice there. <laughs> on the other side of the coin, also a bit of an outlier right so our our job is literally protecting sensitive data and so you know we eat our own dog food, so we have some of those things in place so being an outlier there one of the things that we do to try and solve those problems for others is both in education uh you know kind of helping them understand the problem but then very clearly articulating and pointing out where those weaknesses are like helping them discover exactly where that sensitive data is that they're going to need to protect from the executive side of things, I think your challenge really is more of a it's, it's a friction reduction one so that you can get those controls in place as well as an education one so that they can understand the impact. Sadly, to someone's point earlier, you do still have a lot of people that go about this thinking, well, why would they target me? It's not why would they target you? It's, it's because you are a target, not because you are. You. <laughs> because you're yeah. there. Uh, yes. Uh, Gabe, uh, Gabe, have you or, or your company in research looked at ways for the data to be actually to phone home so if i'm an executive and now i'm going or anyone who works in the company i'm gonna have to work from home now i copy a bunch of my files to a usb thumb drive i go home i stick that in my pc there are ways to make some of those documents phone home uh is that like if you thought about that and in, in ways to, to track that because that's a hard problem to solve no it's a hard problem to solve here's the good news it got easier when the internet got you know quite a bit more ubiquitous. It was much harder in the 90s and early mm -hmm. 2000s when internet wasn't just completely pervasive everywhere we right, went. Right, right. 5G around in our back pockets, right? Um, but for us specifically, you know, we work with some of the partners in the, the IRM, DRM space so that when we find it and we, we classify it, that we can make sure that those technologies are, are accurately tracking it around. It's a combination of layers. It's always mm -hmm. gonna be layers. I don't know any any one policy solution, et cetera, that's going to combat these problems. So, sorry, can you, Gabe, can if, you if kind you... of explain what what your technology, like the technology side of of your company, and kind of what what they're doing around this particular piece? Yeah, Just sorry, Gabe, some of the we, yeah, and myself. we haven't briefed Tyler on what on what Spearon actually does, <laughs> so it's a good opportunity to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Who are sure. you, and what do you do? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Hey, Gabe. <laughs> Just teeing that up for you, buddy. <laughs> it's it's um, we were we were founded on the notion that sensitive information is the most important thing that that individuals and, and corporations have to be able to protect. And that image you flashed a second ago, you know, most people start with that that last circle in mind. They kind of they kind of approach this from I need to be able to comply with things, whether that is just like internal policies or external regulations. They kind of start there, and and what we what we do for them is help them make their way through that. All right, in order for you to control that information, and let's take today's scenario, if you need to be able to control that information in a hostile environment that is your employees' home networks, then you're gonna you're gonna need to be able to 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 understand 
getting that information and, and understanding of that information starts with classifying it and all that backs right up into the discovery so the thing we do starts with that finding it un- and then classifying and understanding it someone talked before about these very binary classifications of it's either you know protected or it's public and so we break those things down and ensure that we're putting more discrete labels on them so that you understand exactly what that data is this data may be pii so we can label it as that but is it also based on the way it's processed is that information that should be shared with a third party if it's not then it probably shouldn't exist on any of those contractor laptops or even employee laptops when they go home with it because that that's that's information that should be controlled centrally inside the organization. Is that information, you know, fulfillment data? Is that the kind of stuff where you just use it to to send packages to folks? Again, there, there's different controls that you're going to place on it based on those things. It's all it's all PII from that perspective. But telling you that it's PII isn't enough to be able to apply the appropriate controls. And so that's that's kind of our bread and butter, right? We help them understand exactly what that data is so that we can apply the right controls and all of that because we're just finding it first which is Gabe, Gabe I'm, I'm curious do you, now is your solution agent based or is it just tied to the domain or or both it is both it's okay. both agent based um it, you, we can also reach out into the cloud uh we've got endpoint agents that'll cover windows os x linux so whatever they're working on from from a home machine even right we've got those platforms covered so gabe if i have my work laptop and it has the agent on it right and i'm, I'm working and i go yeah there's a virus outbreak like not a computer virus outbreak but a physical virus outbreak i gotta go work from home i'm gonna copy all my stuff to my laptop when i go home and i fire up my laptop now whether i have to connect to the vpn or not does your software go hey Paul shouldn't have those files outside of the, the, the building, outside of our network. Let me remove those for him because that's a huge security risk. Is it is it that level of granular control? It really nailed it. It will do exactly that. So mm. if I had a policy that said Paul is not supposed to have PCI data on his machine, if you tried putting that on there and then going home, it's yeah. not going to allow it. The policy will not allow it. It'll take a number of different actions. Sure. You just remove it. Yeah, you can encrypt you, it. We can, talked about this. You can encrypt it, right, uh, at rest. Yeah, you can you can hand that control off to something else that to, to to protect it. Like like you talked about, like an IRM DRM that'll phone home even. So yeah, it'll it can do a number of those different controls once I define the policy of what should Paul have access to and not have access to on that machine right. on his. That's awesome, Tyler. Do, does that does that help kind of paint? I know. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're, that, that I'll, helps. Does that also folks touch with... the data the data pieces as well? Like you have the agent, you've got the the domain. Does that also like tag or? Uh, touch the data that's being protected as well yeah it works at the data level so it's going to tag and classify it at the data level so that it's it's embedded into to those files and so no matter where they're moving around you, your additional controls but those controls are on the machine those controls are you know a TASV or a dlp whatever whatever additional controls you already have layered in it will mm-hmm. pick those things up does that po- provide a uh... Does that provide revocation as well or the ability to, like, say a data breach does happen or something sensitive does leak? Are you able to revoke and or uh, stop that? I, I only know of one solution that does that, so I don't – I'm just curious on that piece. That's a good question. I, I pass revocation of access directly off to things like, uh, like AIP, but I can and will, like – revoke wider access and and reduce access down to just administrative levels okay nice do you have the ability i mean other than sort of the usual sex suspects in terms of uh you know pci or pii or financial data do you, how do you handle sets of data that you know company x says we think this particular data is really sensitive for us but the casual observer might not consider it to be sensitive data. How, how do you how, how do you work with customers to help them uh, capture the data that they think is classified or, or sensitive beyond sort of what we all kind of know is is sensitive data? Yeah, no, I get it. I, I kind of talk about those things in like those discrete classifications versus those non-discrete ones. Like mm-hmm. what you're describing is like, so I know a social sort of number is you know PII because it's defined by X Y Z, but that. Right may not be my MA document so yeah no you can you can define custom classifies and recognizes that will do that so you can define uh you can tell the system the system can help you decide and understand what a custom a custom classifier looks like for your information 
and then apply that. To does, it, does it necessarily have to be something that's searchable? I mean, you know, something you can sort of code to look for it, or is there a way to uh, maybe tag a certain set of data or something like yeah, that's that? A, that's a great question. Yeah, like how do you how do you know what what data is what? Right. right. Yeah. Somewhere in between, right? So it's it's usually a process of let's understand what those documents look like. So you know, uh, you know, we present some of those to us and then you know have the system know that these things in particular are what makes it sensitive to you right so like based on metadata content who yeah. it's going from and to gives it the data a profile that you can then act on is that exactly accurate? right number of things there's there's a few dozen different types of of identifies including things like including things like metadata, et cetera, that it'll pick up on. Um, some of the new recognizers that, that we're working on and that we, like one of them that we released recently, they're uh, a little bit more sophisticated in so much that they're they're trained ML models. So like, you know, they, they, took, they took documents and then learned to recognize them for what they are. Hence the reason uh, very, very cleverly, we call them recognizers. <laughs> and then it'll, uh, it, it'll identify them based on that information. I mean, I, I would think like, you know, maybe the the lawyers within an organization or maybe the C-level people, you could like anytime they're talking or sending any kind of data, just because it's them, regardless of what it is, we're going to consider it confidential or classified or sensitive and flag it something along well, those lines. Well, I mean, you mentioned ML. If you've ever read a legal document Drink. versus a marketing <laughs> document, right. I mean, us as humans, I mean, there's a pretty good distinction between that. I could imagine you could train some ML to go, that's a legal document, Drink. and that's a marketing document, <laughs> right? If there's more than three Latin words. Yeah. <laughs> it's a legal doc. Well, I mean, it's not even machine learning. It's just like an, it's like an if it, statement, it could, right? It could, be, it could be marketing lorem ipsum. Yeah, it's a cut, right? <laughs> but like going back to you know, my DOD training, one of, the, one, of the, one of the key reasons why data was classified at, at compartmented level very often wasn't the data itself. It was what we call methods and sources. It's right. how yeah. we got the data. At, at, in, but and, at some and, point, you have to... But, but there's a but the, I think there's a parallel here. There I, is, yeah. Because I remember, uh, you know, just uh, as an example, um, you know, w when I did one of my tours in the op side and I was code breaking, I remember I broke a code, and the underlying message was basically a shopping list, and it's like we need these supplies, but it, you know, it was all classified top secret because of how oh. we had gotten the message right. in the first place. <laughs> but when you got down to the actual content, I'm like. You know, right? They need toilet paper. They need sanitizer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, they, you but know. I mean, at at some point, you have to rely on information from the human or the user, right? Like right. It, in our own uh, software that that we write, for every segment that we do, we assign hosts and guests. Mm -hmm. And as much as I would love to automate that process, there's a, a human, whether it's the actual host or guest that says, yes, I'm going to do this or not, or it's one of us going, yes, Jeff and Larry and Tyler and Lee are the, the hosts on the show. Like, a software can't figure it out. I mean, maybe I could put, like, malware on all of your systems and, and figure out, like, voice, voice, voice recognition voice recognition, and, and your Skype behavior and Zoom behavior that you participated in the show and tag you. Right, but in most cases, at some point in software, you have to rely on a human to provide the software piece of information. Right, right? Uh, uh, I real, am not a robot. Real quickly, Gabe, I'm curious. Back to your anecdotal, you you were saw some organizations recently that had a bunch of desktops. Out of curiosity, what what type of industry were they? Uh, so two of them are actually in the technology industry, which was equally surprising. They sell oh, they sell tech they they sell software. Okay. Um, they don't sell security software though, but they they sell software. Um, one of them's kind of in the geospacing. The other one is uh, is in the industrial industry. Um, a third one is in the logistics business that also sells software. Huh. The other two were retail. Interesting. So it kind of blows my th well. M maybe one theory is you know the fact that you know these companies invested in desktops years ago. They don't want to pay for an upgrade or a refresh, which is a common problem. Uh, yep. I was thinking maybe maybe the companies that have desktops rather than laptops, maybe just maybe they're more the f the mature organizations that we talk about that tend to be you know like f you know 
fi- financial institutions, banking, and things like that. No. But I theory mean, blown, I guess. But what I could totally see is you have a desktop at at work, right? And then, oh, by the way, we'll issue you a phone or a tablet or a Chromebook, so that you know when you're traveling or you go home, you can still do maybe not the full blown software engineering that you do in the in the mm-hmm. office, but you can check email and do other stuff. And oh, by the way, maybe there's some type of remote access software that can give you access to be able to, right. you know, write your software and check it in or whatever. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't know if there's any way, any rules of thumb to this. I don't know. Think about it. a lot of these companies did this probably as a mechanism for trying to protect data, right? They were like, okay, we have a problem. People's home networks are insecure and they lose laptops all the time. That's it. We need a lot of work on stuff in the right. office. Well, it's probably right. more of the latter. It's yeah. probably a capital expense type of thing. Also that. Too. Yeah. So now you have this other externality, that the COVID virus, that's causing the reverse commute here in this state. So, I mean, it was just, this is one of those things that, you know, might happen every decade or so that causes just this, this major opportunity for chaos and data loss. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think one of the early decisions the companies need to make for their newly remote workforce, if they don't have laptops, are they going to scramble to try to issue them laptops or are they going to let them use personal devices? I mean, I think that's a huge decision right there. It's right. a really big well, lift to your IT department to send, to configure those laptops, get them all out. So that's so one of the companies is doing exactly that. They're, they're scrambling to try and, and outfit their remote employees. But between now and getting them outfitted, they're letting them use their own because you, know, you, you can't outfit them overnight. You can't even do it in a week. Right. But for better or for worse, a lot of enterprise operations are already using cloud-based. You, know, yeah. you mentioned Office 365, Salesforce. I mean, a lot of corporate enterprise applications are now in the cloud anyways, which probably makes it easier. I don't know if it makes it helps with the security aspect of things. Makes it easier to grab that information and put it all over the place. Really, yep. that's the problem. Another thought I had was because uh, some, you know, I, I think I was reading your little, you know, pentagram thing, and you mentioned compl- <laughs> pentagram thing. <laughs> pentagram. It's, it's five <laughs> five circles. It's a pentagram. I thought it was three, but okay. It was five. It's on our website. Oh, okay. Um, you know, it, one of them was compliance. I'm 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 curious as to how like you know GDPR CCPA if they're gonna like sort of suspend things for a little while, just given the fact that there's going to be so much data just everywhere. And if oh. companies want to stay in business, you know, are they going to lighten up on enforcement or, or consequences for some period of time? That's, I hope not. That's my information. That's your information. Just, right. just yeah. because these organizations may not have been prepared for this this eventuality or maybe unseen event. I, I really hope they don't just get lax of my privacy because of that. I, I do not approve even a little bit. If anything, I, I, I want them to be a little bit more strict now about making sure people don't get lax with my private information. So connect the dots. How do they maintain or begin to do the things that they should have been doing and still facilitate productivity? So I think every organization is going to have to look at themselves and first understand where the, the gaps in their data security practices are. Um, and some of it is the basics like we've discussed, right? Like. Do, do those systems do those systems even have um, do you know about all the systems have you inventoried them are they patched like some of the basics are just always 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 in play and then some of the data basics are always in play just like you needed to know where all the systems are do you know where all the data is um, I, I think I think this is one of those times where we shouldn't be looking at you know that you're going to see a lot of ridiculous technology come out of the woodwork promising to keep you safe from things and the basics here is really what we need to return to. Where's where where are the systems? Where's the data? Find find those two, and then you can start. Then you can start assessing what your your risk profile and posture is, and applying controls to it. How how, how do you do that when you're already remote? A- aware <laughs> awareness. I I think Gabe. I think for a lot of organizations, right? If you're everyone's like, okay, work from home, cool. But hey, if you work with data. Don't store it on your home PC for longer right. than you have to, right? I think it's a, uh, a teaching moment for everyone to just be like, hey, you got to be diligent short of implementing technologies overnight that might be able to help that. Uh, also couple that with that those computer systems are not owned by the organization. So I, mm-hmm. for me, if it were my company, I'd yeah. be like, hey, 
if you work with data at home, that's cool. Just make sure you remove it when you're done and don't open us up to, to any additional risk. Maybe there's other things that you can do in terms of educating the user about home security and or, I mean, it, uh, provided you can get the stuff from China, right? <laughs> Maybe sending people uh, home, home firewalls or better security devices to protect themselves at home. That's where I would go. Are there any lessons learned or any is there any way to carry forward BYOD policies? Because for the first time in my career in the last couple of years when m in the latest job I have, I'm doing work from a personally owned phone. Um, you know, and they've got hooks into it and stuff like that. I, are, are there any carryover uh, steps or processes to think about in terms of the idea of BYOD? And now it's, you know, it's not bring your own device, it's use your own device. Mm. Open uh, question to anyone. Uh, <laughs> me, me personally, if it's, a, if it's on the mobile side, uh, I would be a huge fan of the containerized type of service. Right. So you have like, uh, I can't remember the name of some of the products, but you have a container and all of your work stuff, your email, your documents, you name it, yep. mm -hmm. live yep. within that container. So SharePoint. It can be. No, no it's, uh, it's not a container. <laughs> no, not SharePoint. You can, you can Teams. Not, not, um, not Kubernetes either. <laughs> no, no. So you have all those applications within an app, a container itself. Right. The, the storage of that data is encrypted by the application itself. Um, and it is controlled by yeah, there the was organization. A company, there was a company there, that made those bunch, phones. Uh, it's not even the phone. Right. It's the there's app software itself. software in the app. Yeah. Yeah, right. and well, we used to call it MDM, but now there's a whole bunch of yeah, other uh, uh, acronyms. So, but M, this is a, a type of MDM where everything's containerized. The other option is you control the user's phone with policies, and mm -hmm. that scares the crap out of me because it's my phone, yep. and you want to tell me I can't put pictures on it and I can't surf to various websites that I may want to from my phone. Yeah, you know what we do with that? We get one of the older phones or tablets, and uh -huh. that's the one like where my wife may or may not work does that and right we well, just we found a device and we're like that's your work phone this is your personal phone yeah, so we actually right. did physically and, and, separate and, and effectively with the containerization for the mdm style stuff is you're getting a virtualized environment yes to do your work virtualized stuff. in the phone yep. and yep. your phone is your still your phone but if you want to do work email it's within this container right. and they can wipe everything out of that container that they so choose mm. so are there products like that to <laughs> extend to a you know a home system whether it's a laptop or oh a so jeff's question is are there like m DM type, style type stuff for home computers. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's just, you know, install Docker on your home PCs, <laughs> and then I'll let you pull from my registry because everyone knows how to do that, right? Right. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I think with Gabe, I'm, I'm with Gabe in that, you know, I think the best defense right now is awareness and education yeah. and just trying to, you know, hammer home sort just sort of basic hygiene and, and basic practices of th things to do and don't do with the knowledge that people are going to abuse it anyway, whether mm -hmm. they're doing it deliberately or not. I mean, in my experience, anecdotally, people that, you know, in the older days, it was more people taking their work home with them. They'd take a work laptop home with them or they would do stuff from home because they were VPN inning and the whole split, tun yep. split tunneling thing. But they were always doing it because they had a deadline, because their boss needed something, because they had to get it done yesterday. And they knew that they were breaking the rules, but they also had to get it done. Right. And, and it was temporary, theoretically. Theoretically. Somewhere so, out there in Manhattan, there's a temporary patch cable I ran back in the 90s also. Right. So yeah. <laughs> it's definitely still there. <laughs> this is yeah, true. So I, had, I had a couple of things. Sure. Sure. Um, one that Larry reminded me of both um, the old good now uh, now BlackBerry containerized environment, as well as Samsung Knock Android Work that do containerize. And actually, other uh, uh, MDM solutions have containerization, although they don't call it that anymore. That allows you to do that. But and and actually, I prefer that as well. I don't like the you're going to wipe my whole device. I like you're going to enterprise wipe me and take out. Mm. The enterprise data only. Right. If I got to do uh, if I got to do BYOD, um, and uh, you grant the BYOD permission, the thing can still wipe your device. Uh, the thing that was going that's been going through my head around um, we talk about personal versus corporate laptop for working at home, but one of the things that we've been having a conversation about is 
what about the connection of that corporate laptop to personal peripherals? Mm -hmm. uh, so you've got the guy home with a secure laptop or gal, and now do we let them hook up their thumb drives or even, you know, hell, a, 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 a printer, Thunderbolt a monitor is a bus connection. Right. You know, I, I know I'm a little biased in this, but um, anyone here ever, ever trained any martial arts? You know the best way to, to block a roundhouse? Not be there when the guy throws it, right? Yep. <laughs> exactly. You know, my don't, teacher don't told me there. that all the time. He's like, it's really going to hurt if you're there when the punch lands, so don't yeah, be, be there, there when the punch lands, yep. right? <laughs> yeah. And, and same, same thing. Our martial arts instructor yeah. says, you're only using martial arts to get the person far enough away from you so you can run away. Yes. <laughs> That's how I feel about the data on the system. You, you, you know how you keep the attacker from getting it? Don't let it be there. Yeah. Like, <laughs> That's a great go. point. Don't let the data get there. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, and, and Lee, I think one of the things that I think about there is, uh, do you let them use those peripherals? Do you let them use those, do you let them do the same thing in the office? I mean, if no. they take if they take a laptop home and you only allow them to s use specific varieties of thumb drives which pro provide encryption, why would you relax that when they leave the office? Right. You don't. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. However. Now, Gabe, we, however, <laughs> too bad. <laughs> Gabe, we, we had a, an interesting discussion about hacker movies. Do you want to share some of your favorite hacker movies? doesn't have to be the top five because you and I, I think, compared notes and realized that our top five is probably pretty similar, if not exactly the same. But you mentioned some ones that I uh, haven't thought of in a long time and one I had never heard of. Yeah, I mean, favorite hacker movie. So, I mean, the classics, of course, right? You got to get War Games, top of the list. Yep. Um, Hackers, the movie itself, although... Uh, you know, some of it's glorified and some of it is really like, let's just forget the accuracy of it. It's, it's definitely on a list. It's fun. But it's fun. Ones that when, when I think hacking and counterculture um, that I put on that list, SLC Punk with Matthew Lillard is high on that list for me. Oh. It's not about like technical computer hacking and stuff. It's more about counterculture um, and hacking the system. There's a, there's a whole lot of anarchy themes in there. And so what, what was that movie again? SLC Punk. It's Salt Lake City Punk. SLC Punk. From okay. 1998. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're saying there was a hacker scene in Salt Lake City in '98? <laughs> they, they 1888. Made Boom. Just for clarification. Wow, okay. amazing. That that was on my list, and, and I know mm -hmm. it's an awful movie. I think Rotten Tomatoes gives it like a five, but Johnny Mnemonic. I'm sorry, guys. Oh, <laughs> I, I I thought it was a great. Like they basically like ha like the whole movie is about like a USB thumb drive that plugs into a human being, right? Yeah. As is, the from human what I being remember. is the thumb drive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's Last just overloaded himself. I got to I got to put uh, Lawnmower Man on that list too. Yep. Oh, yeah, Lawnmower Man Ooh. comes up a lot. I haven't watched that movie in a long time. Do it. Interesting Do it. list. Denied. Access denied. Access granted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, now I'm gonna have to go back and watch. So, that. I, uh, you know, we, we we talk about all those movies that it has like, to be better than the net. I mean, I'm yeah. just <laughs> not on the list. I hate not it. Not on the list. list. Yeah, it, it was more ever. drama that I had to go back and watch it, and just to like solidify that, like, it is not yep. on my list because it's more drama. It, it, it's more of like her like running around, running away from everyone than it is anything else. <laughs> Why does going? My biggest beef was it was she opens up her laptop and she's instantly connected and instantly yeah. instantly loading the websites. And we talked earlier today. Not in those days. In those days, it would take minutes to load websites and minutes to boot yep. and minutes, minutes to, to load an image on the screen. Yeah, that I mean, doesn't even count getting to the mainframe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's but, the attack in the Gibson different movie. Yeah, one, one of the <laughs> one of the movies that brought me back. Uh, not necessarily a hacker movie, but there's some some element subculture counterculture type stuff to it maybe. Um, that showed up via Netflix for me via DVD the other day was a movie that's absolutely one of my all-time favorites but is very underrated, didn't get lots of good reviews, and it's actually kind of horrible, but it's maybe appropriate or timely, uh, is a movie called The Quiet Earth. Mm -hmm. It's from about 1986. <clears throat> All right, you're putting me on. I'm not familiar. It's, it's going on the list. <laughs> it's on Netflix. So, uh, well, so I don't know if it's on Netflix. I got it via DVD, okay. via Netflix. So, Oh, that <coughs> Netflix. That Netflix. Wow. DVD. Wow. You can still get DVDs from Netflix? <laughs> yep. Yes, you can. Was that was wow. that the DVDs that got deleted because the backups didn't work? Maybe. 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 Oh. Our, our, our sync is a... Is a Oh, too too soon. Yeah, our, our sync is a... <laughs> yeah, there's still 280 movies in my queue. I mean... Wait, what? 
Oh. Um, but uh, yeah, so the if you need me to recover a raid array, <laughs> uh, it's it's long gone. I'm an expert yeah. at that. Yeah, it's long gone. <laughs> but uh, no, the Quiet Earth, the basic premise is uh, uh, all of a sudden, a uh, guy's laying in bed. He's tossing and turning a little bit. It's just starting to become dawn, uh, and there's a flash of light. And his alarm clock goes off. Oh, it's time to get up. And he gets up, and things are kind of quiet. And, uh, he doesn't feel good. So he uh, he gets some breakfast and brushes his teeth, and the radio is still going from his alarm clock, and he shuts that off, and he gets in the car, and there's nobody on the road. And he gets to work, and there's nobody there. Like, literally, that flash of light wiped everyone off the face of the planet. Gone. Hmm. He's, the, he's the only one the left. TV show was the last man on earth or whatever. <coughs> yeah, kind of like that. the same thing. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like his journey, his descent into insanity. Uh, mm. And then the, uh, the twilight, discovery of Twilight people. Zone, similar kind of yep. kind of feel to it. Yeah. Well, a little bit of a sh shift, but I think we got we got wrap this segment. We need to wrap we it up. Yeah. But honorable mention Brazil. Brazil. Yes. A, a few people did oh, mention I that. Looked that up. Yeah. Mm. That is that a. Uh, there's a couple of German movies on the list. Was it, I don't know if that was a. I don't a know German. if it was German. I, I think it was not, definitely not, foreign. It was definitely a foreign. Well, foreign to the in the U.S. It wasn't like, a U.S. Not a U.S. Film. film. Yeah, it might have been U.K. It's, mm -hmm. it, or it's. I mean, it was. 1985 set. dystopian science fiction directed by Ter Terry Gilliam. Yep. What country is it from? Do you know? Again, we got to wrap this up. I mean, we could read your Wikipedia <laughs> for another hour or, yeah, yeah. or more if you wanted to. But uh, anyway, Gabe. Thank you so much for appearing on Paul's Security Weekly. I believe, uh, is the landing page securityweekly.com forward slash Spirion? Securityweekly.com forward slash Spirion. Go there to find more information. And uh, with that, that will conclude this segment. And we'll be back. Stay tuned. Stay tuned.